my central theme is that your environment impacts your genome through above or epigenetic mechanisms, turning on and off beautiful genes that may be quiet, impacting the structure and function of your brain. We now know that all the things that precede things like drug abuse, psychopathology, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, the cardiovascular illnesses, all are rooted in adversity and typically rooted in adversity in early childhood. So for the past 25 years, I've developed models on how to take our genomic, our epigenomic, our neuroimaging data right into the clinic to help little kids who suffer. The genetic argument is pretty clear. Your child has a highly heritable and treatable condition. He, she, or they got those genes from somebody. Maybe you've been struggling against the yoke of your own genetics. Let me help you so you can help your kid. So I'm going to take all of that stuff and talk to you about what I do. The UVM Wellness Environment is a neuroscience inspired. It comes from brain science. It's time for us to get out of our labs, get out of our journals, and bring this into the lives of moms, dads, and particularly vulnerable brains, 17, 18 year olds. Incentivize based behavioral change. At the University of Vermont, we have over $70 million in our department alone helping people get out of a bad place and moving them to a good place. This is all addiction research. The great Steve Higgins at our place. You've all made New Year's resolutions, highly motivated to change something about yourself, and then rarely complete those. Incentivize-based behavioral change is to pay you to do that thing that you really want to do, but it'll be hard. So we're paying heroin addicts to quit using heroin. 50% reduction in opioid deaths in Vermont the last three years after going all the way to number one. Our hub and wheel, spoke and wheel approach with incentivized based behavior change, paying kids to quit smoking, paying kids to quit using cannabis. So it's a neuroscience inspired, how do you build a healthy brain, incentivized based behavioral change program based on health promotion to a highly, highly vulnerable population, college kids. What is we? That's the wellness environment. I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about IBBC, Behavior change, the neuroscience of the college age brain. We have a paper coming out on 3,300 14-year-olds to 19-year-olds showing which parts of their brain are undergoing cortical organization and development to reify the findings of others, that this is a dangerous, dangerous time of brain development. I'm going to say why it's such a bad idea to send that brain to college. It's like couldn't come up with a worse idea. And then I'm going to show you how to build a healthy brain. So UVM WE, a neuroscience-inspired, incentivized-based behavioral change program to build healthy brains. I'm going to let uh, you all imagine this era that we now live in, that we can bring gorgeous neuroscience to students' lives, to families' lives, to children's lives. We just need to be willing to do it. My program, if you sign up, and you'll see a little bit how successful this has been, you get your own Yogini your own mindfulness coach, your own fitness instructor, your own nutritionist. You get an app with uh, 186 uh, meditations just for college kids built on it, personalized yoga, personalized fitness training. You get a chest strap that you get incentivized to exercise 30 minutes or more a day. You get all of that for free. You take a class called Healthy Brains, Healthy Bodies, Surviving and Thriving to learn and own the neuroscience in your own life. And there's only one rule. I'll throw you out if you have alcohol or drugs in the environment. Doesn't mean you can't go out and use alcohol and drugs. You can. You can go out and drink and smoke and jewel and pot and do all that stuff. You just can't have it in the environment. And I'll explain to you the neuroscience behind that. And then you guys can judge, because I don't, because I'm so mindful I don't judge. <laughs> but I'm going to let non-scientists tell you about our program. Our series, What's Working, looks at innovations that are paying off in America, from education to infrastructure. About one quarter of today's college students admit they suffer consequences from drinking too much. Nearly 700,000 people say they've been assaulted by another student who had too much alcohol. A major university is turning to neuroscience to encourage kids to tap into their books instead of kegs. Jim Maxarod visited that campus to see this program in action. Jim, good morning. I think this is one of my favorite stories. I'm excited to hear it. It's interesting. Good morning to everybody. We went to the University of Vermont, long known as a big-time party school, to see its new approach that combines cutting-edge neuroscience 
with age-old incentives to build students' brains both inside and outside the classroom, and in the process, turn the old college keg stand on its head. You know it's not your average college dorm when violins can be found on every floor. That's music to my ears. But alcohol and pot are nowhere to be seen. This brain is sitting there going, feed me. Psychiatry professor Jim Hoodjack pulled a few strings, filling this freshman dorm with 80 violins while requiring students to sign this contract, no drinking or drugs if they want to live here. A bold experiment on any college campus, but he did it here. We didn't go do it in a place where everyone would say, oh, that would work. We did it in a place where people giggled. At the University of Vermont, senior Cal Rawlins. This reputation it had as a party school. Yeah, I was, was, I was that aware. Deserved? I would say, yeah. But for students not interested in Animal House. Ah, thanks. I needed that. Welcome to the wellness environment. They call us a cult a <laughs> lot. Um, they call me a narc. They say, like, wellness environment's no fun. It's so strict. At this program for incoming freshmen, it's goodbye toga, hello yoga. Late night pizza and round the clock partying have been replaced by Peloton bikes and personal trainers. The idea? Surround students with activities that expand the brain not zap it with the usual menu of college indulgences. I remember even learning that you, you're supposed to eat probiotic yogurt to help your brain function. Probiotic yogurt? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helps your brain function? Dr. Hood's yeah, well, yeah, he'll reinforce that again and again. And again. And, <laughs> and again. again, yeah. And it's working. Binge drinking is down. GPAs and graduation rates are up. The program has grown tenfold in just four years to almost a third of this year's entering class. You couldn't come up with a worse age to send someone to college than when they're 18. It's the most vulnerable brain period other than zero to three. The brain is not done developing at 18. Not even close. So what we're gonna do... So Dr. Hoodjack, the chief of child psychiatry at UVM's medical school, set some rules. No bongs or beer pong, no shot glasses or lighters what he calls neuro-triggers that tempt bad behavior. The kids in my community aren't punished if they go out and have a beer or smoke the dilly weed. It's just not allowed in their dorm rooms. Yeah! Hoodjack frames it as an exercise in making choices, handing out Apple watches for students to record the consequences. They could say, wow, I've had three bad days. And then they can look at their own health survey and go, well, I smoked six bowls, had five shots, and didn't sleep very much. Maybe that's why. For all of us, there's Absolutely. an application. Absolutely. You build a healthy brain, a healthy body will follow. Just begin to feel your body standing. Meditation and exercise have become the activities of choice. Just warm it up. And this doctor's prescriptions are for belly breathing and reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And this is not the ramblings of a crunchy Vermonter. This is hardcore neuroscience. And now, the core of a new approach that's working. I learned all of those healthy habits that I know I need to succeed from this wellness environment. Including the knowledge that college is a time too precious to be wasted. I'm gonna continue up. Now, the approach they're taking at UVM is really catching on. Some big schools like NYU here in New York have started similar programs, and more than 40 others have expressed interest in bringing this approach back to their campuses. I mean, I'm sure I'm like many of, of you. I was 18 when I went off to college, but I was about 12. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip that, because Gail King proclaimed her love for me on national TV. <laughs> and, and in one of those very ironic things. My wife got invited to go on a cruise, and for 37 years of our marriage, she's refused to go on cruises every day, time I've ever said so. But a girlfriend said, why don't you come with me? My wife goes, I'm going to go on a cruise. I said, she, you're not invited. The Oprah girlfriend cruise, and like uh, many people, I'm a huge fan of Oprah. My wife is as well. And so my wife went on the Oprah girlfriend cruise with her girlfriend, and Oprah's girlfriend was Gail King. Gail King found out Teresa and I are together, started saying how great she thought I was, and my wife offered me to Gail King at no cost. <laughs> You're seeing images of this thing. This thing sounds unbelievable, but we have 
200, 300, 400 kids coming down for morning yoga, mindfulness sessions, uh, violin, we have 190 freshmen taking violin in this environment. They're horrible. <laughs> but we publish, I myself have published cortical organization that proceeds with two years of violin training, increasing cortical organization in the ventral medial prefrontal cortical region, improving executive processing, improving emotional regulation. You're going to see why that might be important. We have We Chopped events. On the app, there's uh, neural nutritive programs. The kids get paid for probiotic yogurt. They don't get punished if they have curly fries. They just get incentivized to move to wellness behaviors. No punishments for negative behaviors. You can just see it goes on and on and on. So why do we incentivize it? All of us in this room, no matter how miserable or happy we are, there's something about ourselves we'd like to change. But it's scary. And it's a lot easier just to stay where you are than to make that big move into change. If the NIH now has a whole division called the Division of Behavior Change to fund what is the future of healthcare, whether I drink or not, exercise or not, eat well or not, smoke or not, all comes from one organ in the human body, the human brain. So what if we incentivized it? It's called contingency management. My psychology colleagues in the field created this and have run with it, and we now know whether it's parenting, substance abuse, treatment, or development, contingency management works. So you take that and then you say, I want to apply it to the special sense of the college age brain. I went to Wash U, sadly, when we were just doing things like MRIs. It was very fun. The first year I was there, we ordered MRIs on every single patient we admitted to the psychiatry unit. That was sensible health care, wasn't it? Finally, our chairperson found out and he said, stop that. And we were like, all right. But why? Well, when I went to medical school, the brain was a black box. Now it's this beautiful organ that we can study in great detail. All right, so the dumbbell hypothesis not only maps on my general intellectual quotient, but it ma makes sense out of all my work. So if you guys understand this, if you've never lifted weights in your life and you suddenly said, I want to change the way my body looks, and you went in the gym and you grabbed a five-pound dumbbell and started doing curls, then 10, then 20, then 30, all of you would accept your biceps would get bigger and it'd be stronger. Agree? Yes. Everyone's fine with that. All I did was change the environment, right? All I did is change what I did. Your environment can influence your genome because the only way you can change your proteome is influencing your genome, whether it's through gene expression, epigenetic modification, who the heck knows? We think we know, but who the heck knows? You change the structure and function of the genome, change the structure and function of the human brain, change the structure and function of the human brain leads to changes in what you do, what you think, what you believe. You can pump iron for your body. My work is you can pump iron for your brain. And I believe we should frame shift this thing out, particularly when the brains of young people are engaged in this developmental mismatch that is quite extraordinarily dangerous. So this cartoon existed, I have to always say this when I leave Vermont, because you'll recast me as a Bernista or a liberal from Vermont. The good brain was always blue and the red brain was always bad and has nothing to do with politics, okay? <laughs> Our kids have ancient brains. The human brain pan has not changed much at all in the last 10 years. I'm sorry, 10,000 years. <laughs> I was just thinking about, I really am in part of the United States where the blue brain might be vulnerable. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real quiet for a second here. <laughs> the human brain development was like any other species, was to sustain our species, procreate, and die. And we were supposed to live to be 18, 19, 20 years old. By age 14, and you all know these regions of the brain, the amygdala, fight or flight, rage reactions, I hate myself, I'm stupid, I'm ugly. The nucleus accumbens, the James Brown area of the brain, I feel good, I want pleasure. Fully, de fully developed by 14 years of age, ready to go. This blue area of the brain, the cognitive network, perspective taking, thinking flexibly, attention to the environment, planning for the future, inhibitory control, 23, 24, 25 and women 45, well, <laughs> who, who actually knows, right? 
And what we now know is you have to develop those white matter tracts that underlie those beautiful cortical surfaces, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, connecting the parietal and the prefrontal regions for emotional regulation. I shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. I got an idea. I'm going to go up on the roof of my house with my surfboard and a beer. I'm going to surf off my house and land perfectly and not spell a drop. Red brain. Blue brain, ah. Eh. You might get hurt, not have babies. How do we regulate this blue brain and the red brain, particularly in this age group where the sine qua non, the role model, is Mr. Blue Tarski? And keep in mind, media is influencing our kids not only in old movies like this and subsequent movies, but every morning they wake up, every night they go to bed, they live in the most judgment-heavy environment that you can imagine. You're not hooking up with the right people. You're not hooking up in the right way. You're not wearing the right stuff. You're not using the right drugs. No one's being kind. No one's being gracious in this space. How do we jack this around and not make this goofy? Well, what if we have an enduring belief that stress is bad for little kids, stress is bad for middle kids, and the second most stressful thing that happens to a college kid, first being death of a loved one, is going to college. So now we're sending a brain that's not ready to go to college and having those corticosteroids, which all basic science here from Davidson and uh, McEwen, who should win a Nobel Prize if he hasn't already, show it decreases the structure, the cortical thickness in the prefrontal cortical regions, DLPFC, but also decreases firing. But it makes that red brain go hot. Remember stress? Fight or flight, right? So I've published a bunch of this stuff if you want to read it, the best of times and the worst of times. But for all of you in this room, you probably remember, and I'm going to ask you, please raise your hand if you sort of fell in love 17, 18, 19. Come on, raise your hand. Put it up high. Everyone look around the room for a second. Keep your hands up, if you will. All right, now keep your hand up if you're still with that person. <laughs> all right, so that's statistically deviant right over there. But this is the logic of all possibility that Piaget and others talked about. There's never going to be a more passionate time. There's never going to be a sadder time. And we need to take this to young people so that they know that each day it's going to get easier. What is this transitional age brain from age 4 to 22, 24? This is Javier Castellanos' studies. The brain gets big and fluffy, synapses on synapses on synapses on synapses, talking to each other. You get to be a teenager, you sort of peek out, and then the rest of brain development, my pointer's dead if the rest of brain development from about 14 on is cortical organization or program stellar death, getting rid of synapses you don't need. Okay? So this is some work that I've done with Paul Thompson and others showing brain development. The bottom of the slide is the back of the head, top of the slide, front of the head, cortical organization, pruning, 8, 10, 12. 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. And what you all could have seen naturally is the part of the brain that wasn't done at 16 to 24 was the VMPFC, the PFC, the OFC, the DLPFC, the prefrontal cortical regions for emotional regulation, executive processing, inhibitory control. Not done. Let's send them to college. Let me help you with this pruning thing. Newborn babies, have you all seen one? They're beautiful, right? <laughs> this is the number of synapses in a region of the brain. We've had four of them. Let me just say this publicly. Thank God for mothers. They have so few synapses. They lay there, can't see colors. They celebrate a water bubble. My wife, are, aren't they beautiful? I'm thinking these are the least interesting human beings I've ever seen. <laughs> They have like six synapses, right? Even at a month old, you know, it's, it's still not that big of a deal. But by nine months, they're standing up in their cages. They're banging them around. <laughs> Give me a nine-month-old. I love them. I'm playing music to them. I'm reading to them. I'm feeding her. This is what I want. Two years of age, more synapses, 25,000 synapses per neurons. Everything's talking to everything. That's why a two-year-old behaves that way, right? She should. Look at an adult, 30 to 40% less synapses than a two-year-old. Brain development from that period on is about getting rid of, wax on, wax off, building that bonsai tree. 
And what are we doing for that critical period of bone side development from 16 to 24? Are they building? Are they pruning? And I don't think they are. This inverted amethyst U from Tappert is the period of cortical organization and pruning. It maps perfectly on the transitional age period from 17 to 24. So in a study that we all work on called Imogen, we looked at 3,300 images of teenagers from age 14 to 19, and we said what regions of the brain are going under rapid cortical organization relative to all the other regions. Y'all get that? And it was, of course, the DLPFC, the VMPFC. And if we really honed in, it was these rostral regions that in all animal studies are controlling for inhibitory control in the face of emotional cues. I should do this, I should do that, I should do this. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't kill yourself, you shouldn't jump off a roof, you shouldn't drink that or smoke that. But it couldn't happen at a worse time because their bodies become super powered. They're big and strong and fast and can endure pain. And I don't know why people don't talk about it, but it's the only time in human development where there's a massive shift in morbidity and mortality. Kids are dying. When you make your deal with the devil, whether it be, in my case, Oprah or, or I mean, whoever, Tom Cruise, you'll see the older you get, the more likely you are to die, right? It makes sense, except if you go to college. Why this isn't a public health issue, I have not come to understand it. It's the only time there's a peak or change in the slope of depressive and affective disorders. Otherwise, the slope is even. It's the only time there's a change in the slope and risk for substance use disorders. And in fact, if you can prune your bonsai tree by not becoming an alcoholic or a drug addict during that period, you can almost not become an alcoholic or drug addict. You didn't build your brain out with the right stuff. So it's their fault, right? Well, we don't think so. We think this new idea of using the neuroscience of self-regulation could be a way for us to love people in this brain development period. We think of them as supercharged race cars without brakes. They're ready to go fast. They're ready to roll. And they don't have the regulatory regions. We know that the brain develops from the back front. And unfortunately, inhibitory control, emotional regulation, executive processing, if you all just went like this, you'll realize you probably did that when you were talking to your teenagers at one time or another, right? You've all seen a house being built, right? That six months before it's done, half the roof, there's wires hanging all over the place, there's construction material, looks horrible, right? That's what you need to understand about this age group. It's a brain under construction. You can't skip that period where half the roof was on, and yet you go back six weeks later, you see a gorgeous house. Oh my God, that's beautiful. How do we in medicine, how do we in education, how do we help people build this beautiful house in the face of this developmental mismatch? Here's an adult looking at a picture of a person smiling, frowning, and looking neutral, this happy faces test. That's the anterior cingulate of the prefrontal cortex. She's happy, he's sad, dude's mellow. You get that? This is an 18-year-old looking at exactly the same pictures. That's the amygdala. Do you understand? Completely different regions of the brain looking at exactly the same cues. The amygdala. That dude is so happy. She is so sad. This developmental mismatch written by Jay Geed and B.J. Casey and others, the accumbens, I need my dopamine, the amygdala, fight or flight, done, 14, 16 where the developmental mismatch of that regulatory region not until mid or late 20s. So let's go up on the roof. Let's grab our surfboard. Now, I think this allows us a way to look at this and go, I get this now. He has not yet cortically organized his dorsal lateral prefrontal cortical region. <laughs> I've certainly used that with all my kids. I come in the house, they start getting on me and I'll go, She's going through a difficult developmental period. Her nucleus accumbens is fully matured, yet her DLPFC is not. It works. I have hundreds of these giffies, parkour no more, highly complicated ideas that would have been better off not pursued. And then we send that brain to college. You open the envelope, oh, my kid got into VCU. 
or UVA. Oh my God, it's great, right? It's not. <laughs> and the kids, they don't want to fail, right? And you say, because they got into v U UVA, it was a great basketball tournament, by the way. I don't know if that's okay to say. Here. Yeah. I won my pool, thank you, UVA. Do you know that UMBC, the horrible thing that happened to UVA the year before? Do you know they were, UVA was number one, UMBC was a number 16 beat them? UMBC defeated number one ranked University of Vermont in their tournament to get into the tournament. We were really unhappy to see them beat UVA. So you say they got in, wow, my kid's a genius. He's not. <laughs> but every mom and dad thinks that. And then we take that scared, frightened, underveloped brain and we put it in an environment where every time they turn around, someone's offering them a fifth of vodka, a bong, a jewel, a vape, oxycodone, speed, LSD. It's a million kids. It's not 900,000 kids. 100,000 rapes, let's say what it is. 2,000 deaths, dropping out of school, schools getting asked now, why haven't you stopped this? School's getting sued now because people understand a five-year graduation rate across the country is 50%. If universities actually went to a parent and say, look, you can spend $300,000 over the next five years to send your kid to UVA, and there's a 50% chance he, she, or they will graduate. Parents would say no. It's actually not true about UVA. UVA is around 85%, which is pretty good right now and has had higher periods, but there are other universities that you should care about with graduation rates of 30%. The gold bars, that's college age. All the other bars are all the other ages. We're, we're actually doing well with alcohol and drug abuse around this country across all different drugs except one age group. And this isn't just kids in college, this is kids in this age group. Why? Because we've normalized drugs. It's, my kid's going to drink when he goes to college. There's a program called Alcohol EDU that tells kids you have to take it before you go to college and says, if you have six drinks, you're getting in a really dangerous zone if you do six drinks in two hours. Kids who don't drink say, well, I can have five. There's no evidence this thing works, by the way. You should do a deep dive on the evidence for Alcohol EDU, and they show that all kids, when they go to college, they drink more. And Alcohol EDU go, says, well, we're, we're going to call that the college effect. How do you know it's not I'm training effect? And you all know this, this isn't fun. And it's getting worse. And now we have contagions. And then we have geniuses that say, well, let's, let's make TV shows about why it's a smart thing to do. And 90 plus percent of these kids, both the aggressors and the victims, are experiencing this in the face of alcohol and drugs. Now, I'm not saying predators wouldn't predate if they weren't on alcohol or drugs, but the, the correlation is very high. <laughs> By the way, I, I'll draw you to the expert on understanding space right now. <laughs> See, I did rip on the Democrats a little bit. I got, got that out of the way. Here's the shocker. This is one of hundreds of papers that shows if you smoke weed and drink all the time, you don't do good in school. So what do you do? How do you build a healthy brain? Well, this is the science of our colleagues. My own group has contributed to this. Many groups have shown these are the things that change the cortical structure and function in the prefrontal orbital frontal regions of the brain. Diminish the size of the amygdala, diminish the contribute, contribution of amygdala firing rates. You got that? I can't do them all. I'll do two. What you do impacts your genome, impacts your brains, your thoughts, actions, and behavior, whether here the movement of mindfulness, either seated meditation or yoga. This is my partner in crime in this, a guy named John Kabat-Zinn. If you have anything, any contact with mindfulness and medicine, you will know this name. He comes up every year. He teaches my students. He helped me develop mindfulness-based health promotion for this age group, not stress reduction. We want to just promote your health. We want to build a healthy brain because we want you to have full awareness of cessation. We want you to be in the present moment. He started saying and wrote in 1982, I don't care if you like mindfulness, do it for eight weeks, come back and tell me how you feel. And now, and I'll show you this study, 
after eight weeks of MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, in the same way you could build your chest, your lats, and your biceps, you can now reduce the volume of your amygdala and increase cortical organization in these regulatory regions. But then he went on to do studies and show mindfulness-based stress reduction, the most powerful way for self-regulation, for out-treating anxiety over drugs that currently are prescribed. If you learn mindfulness-based stress reduction, eight-week course, it's eight weeks, but if you learn it, you'll do 15% better on high-stakes math tests, things you're scared of. If it's a test you know you're going to nail, you get no benefit from being able to meditate. It's a cool way for you to think about the blue brain and the red brain. Do you understand that? There's a little team up in New England that we root for it's called the Boston Red Sox. Watch Martinez walk to the plate. Stops. Breathes. Thinks. Based on his MBSR, his mindfulness training. Watch Curry go to the bench and drop a towel on his head and meditate it six minutes ago in each half and then look at Curry's videos on how he didn't become a star until he became mindful. This is how we sell it to kids. Susie Smalley, my buddy from Los Angeles on whole genome expression, mindfulness in the salt of ADHD. What did we learn from neuroimaging of mindfulness? It reduces the size of your amygdala in almost a dose response way. The more you meditate, the more in control your amygdala is. The smaller your amygdala gets, Reductions in perceived stealth stress, how stressed out I am. We start and end every class with five-minute meditations. We have 180 rewarded meditations on the app. We do walking across campus, stop, breathe, and thinks. 120 scholarship athletes live in my environment, no conduct violations. And they're meditating the heck out of it. We did make the NCAA tournaments. It didn't go as far as UVA. Now, you take folks with severe anxiety disorders, Teach them mindfulness, reduce activation in the amygdala and increase cortical organization, the PFC. Neurocorrelates of focus attention just through three seconds in. Pause, six seconds out. Jump up into the blue brain, quiet that amygdala. Take folks with anxiety disorders and actually change the resting state into the task positive cognitive network. Easy way for you to understand this, and it's somewhat sad, but almost certainly all of your least favorite times are when you are by yourself and thinking your own thoughts. You go into the default mode network which spends a ton of time down in these subcortical regions. That's why most of us want to be doing stuff all the time. Mindfulness allows us a chance to be alone and rewire our brains. Did you get that? I hope you do. So here's Tabasso and Fabro's study. Eight weeks of mindfulness changed the structure of the amygdala, changed connectivity to the PFC, what kabat said in 82. My favorite study, you take 280 Marines, randomly um, uh, selected, 147, you do the eight-week MBSR training. The others you do Marine Corps as usual. I'm not saying that's the same thing as college, but it's a big change in the life for 18-year-old kids. Those who took MBSR, had markedly reduced collateral kills in virtual reality kill games, had markedly reduced symptoms of PTSD, and far higher kill rates than those who did not. And in imaging, had hyper-functioning blue brains and reduced red brains, to put it simply. So why the core now uses MBSR in training its troops, not to have them become more mindful, gracious people, but to have them become better at what they do, whether it's sports or music, or protecting our country. You get it? Hope you do, because mindfulness builds that blue brain and reduces the red brain. Exercise. And not exercise for your body, exercise for your brain. And not three days a week, and not PX90 or insanity, a 30-minute walk. I just finished a grant where all the kids in my program get a chest strap, and if they do 30 minutes a day of walking or higher, they get 10 bucks. American dollars. If they do it seven days a week, they get a $30 bonus, $100 a week. I had $1.5 million in the incentive part of this grant. Thought it was going to last till June. It didn't. I had to go back to the uh, 
funding agency and say, can I borrow some more money to build healthy brains? As I shared with Danielle, Deanna Bark, and I just came out with a paper in 10-year-olds. Exercise every day, build your hippocampus reduction in symptoms of depression. Right? 10-year-olds, the A, B, C, D study. So 30 minutes a day, better mood, less anxious, improved academic performance. Our kids aren't doing it, costing us trillions of dollars. But if you look at basic science studies of the impact of daily exercise on attention problems, daily exercise on anxiety, daily exercise on depression. Recent paper of mine on 13,583 people, five days of exercise reduced suicide attempts, even in kids who are bullied by 23%. And if you did seven, it was 33%. Docs say, take, take your medicine seven days a week, whatever you do. They don't say exercise seven days a week, they say if it's not too cold or you feel like it or whatever, got it completely backwards. Animal research shows it's true, outperforms anxieties, antidepressant drugs. If you exercise daily and you're a young person, as your aerobic capacity improves, so does your mathematic achievement and so does your reading achievement, things that college kids probably want to know. And your executive processing skills increase almost 600-fold higher than an aspirin a day keeps the heart attack away. If you learn anything today, put on your Fitbit or your Apple Watch and walk seven days a week and watch your life change. Because it builds your hippocampus, and the bigger your hippocampus becomes, the better your emotional memory, the better your processing speed. It builds these white matter tracts that connect that parietal region to the PFC. So, a wee bit about we. Wow, I can't believe I'm on time. This starts with this class that provides the neuroscience and genomics of wellness because college kids don't want to be told what to do. They just want to have the information. And they are certainly willful enough to say, I can make my own decision. And that's how we teach this class in a non-judgmental way. We bring in the best of the best. Uh, Zinn comes in and teach. Margaret Martin, Obama Citizen of the Year, twice. Did you all see the Super Bowl two years ago? Beyonce, Bruno Mars, Coldplay. You probably saw 60 kids run on stage with violins. That's from our Harmony Project in America. Every one of those kids going to a major university. Four years before, none of those kids graduated from high school. Front above the fold, Boston Globe, NBC News, CBS News. 50% reduction campus-wide on drug violations in the city of Burlington by UVM students. This infects entire campuses. Cover of, UC, of NCAA magazine. For the last four years, I put on the 420, 5K for wellness. So I want you to know this about me. I know what most of you will be doing 420 at 420. Yeah, like you don't know. When we started this, there'd be 1,500 Vermonters, Vermont kids out there lighting up at 420. Now we get 1,500 kids running, there's only 300. We don't judge them. We offer an alternative opportunity for young people who have given the choice to engage in wellness things, and it was cool, they would take it. So I do research on everything. Uh, Hilton gave me a bunch of money. Apple's given us money. I created this app with personalized wellness on it. It gives them the chance to monitor their own activity by filling out every night six items of risk behavior, six items of health behavior, and did you have a happy, sad, or okay day? And then they can look at my happy days, my sad days, and my okay days. Personalized yoga, personalized fitness, nine-minute workouts, all on the app. I chose the nine minute workout because of a movie called Something About Mary when Ben Stiller was in the front seat of his car with a mass murderer and he said, why don't you do a nine minute workout? And the mass murderer said, what are you crazy? And I said, I bet I can do that. <laughs> Every time they do a workout, they get 500 Wii coins. Every time they meditate, they get 500 Wii coin coins. Every time they do yoga, they get coins. Here's our meditation library. They not only get trophies, they get Wii coins. The Wii coins go into a Wii bank. Once they put their wee money in a wee bank, they get wee hats and wee shirts and wee socks. This is a cryptocurrency that has held its value. <laughs> so every night they answer these questions. How many hours did you sleep? How much exercise did you get? How many fruits and veg? How much water did you sleep? We have hydration monitors on the kids correlating their hydration status to mood. 
How many minutes of mindfulness? How much music did you produce? How much time did you waste on Netflix? <laughs> I could just go on, but Netflix gets it done. How many beers did you have? How many shots? How much marijuana? How many jewels, joints, tobacco equivalents did you have? How was your day? Sad, happy, okay. Then you can go in and say, on my happy days, I did these things. On my okay days, I did these things. On my sad days, I did these things. So the students themselves can say, I'm having a bad week. And I always just say, check your health records. Or my favorite, Doc, I'm one of these anxious dudes who smokes a lot of weed and I'm failing. Check your health record. Doc, I'm smoking a lot of weed. <laughs> it's your journey. We now have 1,500 kids in it. Last year, we could have accepted the entire freshman class. Could have been in we. And this year, again, we've had to turn to a lottery. 90% reduction this year of in-house alcohol violations, but this is campus-wide violations. Our retention rates in we now put us favorably with places like UVA and, and other top-tier universities around the country. And those of you who are in the dean level or president level or provost level know each percent retention improved is between half a million and a million dollars saved for the university. So you start saying, how would you fund all this thing? You can fund it internally. But you need to know our yoginis are in our yoga program. Our dietitians are masters in dietetics and nutrition. Our fitness instructors are exercise and movement sciences instructors. We built a model that runs internal to the university. We do research, deep dive in phenotyping, substance abuse, experts, et cetera, emotional behavioral health, general medical health three times a year, but then we get these nightly survey data. So this is every day of the week last year for 3,000 kids. Blue is we. We have as many kids who aren't in our environment on campus. So this is, how is your mood? And what you want to notice is only about 50% of kids are even happy when they get to college. That's kind of sad. And then there's a big drop in the first two weeks when they're going, oh, shit. <laughs> college is hard. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a party. But it doesn't really look that good. But then you go like this. They're kind of sad, and they get super happy when they go home for Thanksgiving. And then they get depressed during finals, and they happy when they go to winter break. They get depressed between midterms, and you, you get it. So this year, we prescribe things for the kids knowing this stuff because we also found out some other interesting stuff. When they went home for Thanksgiving, they quit exercising. When they went home for Thanksgiving, they started sleeping 14 hours a day, which, by the way, you can't go from six hours of sleep to 14 hours of sleep and then go back to six hours of sleep and be healthy. So we have a sleep program that we send them home on. They drink a hell of a lot more with mommy and daddy or their buddies at home. So we sent all the kids off. It's going to be really hard for you to redo what you've just achieved. And what you'll see, this is our mindfulness practice stuff. I, didn't, I don't have it in here. What you would have seen is when they come back this year, they're sleeping less at home, drinking less at home, and exercising more at home. Now, it helps they got the chest strap and all that stuff to incentivize it. All right, all health emerges from emotional behavioral health. Did I convince you of that? So then I'd like all of you to take a walk every day for seven days a week, because particularly if you engage with students in a college and testing services, as a professor, as a teacher, walk them. Take them out for walks. Mondays I see patients from 6 till 6. I walk as much as I can with my patients. Meditate with them. Modern neuroscience is providing us a new way to think about building healthy brains. No developmental epoch has been ignored as much as the transitional age brain. Strategies include prescribing brain building activities, not only for those who are not yet in the grips of substance abuse, but especially for those who are in the grips of substance use and abuse. Earlier I said you can go out and smoke and you can go out and drink, because I invite moms and dads to send their children who are losing the battle with substance abuse, with psychosis, with mood and anxiety disorders into our environment. And we couldn't do that if we knew that they were going to sneak out and grab a joint or some of their other drugs. These wellness activities I've characterized. This is one example how to do it. And I just really hope we're up to 180 universities now are asking for this menu of, of services. And I'd, I'd love it as a physician to see if we could help 
people in this uh, age period. Thank you very much.